It's a lovely Delhi winter morning. This two-day discussions that we are having, the Indo-Pacific political, security, and economic dimensions, Japan Foundation, ICRIER, and the Nehru Memorial are hosting this event. Before I start, of course, I would request all of you to, since all of us carry this, if we could put the ringer down, switch it off, put it on silent mode, it will help us. The Indo-Pacific has suddenly, I would say so belatedly, it should have come up on the priority list of people on the radar screen long time back. Fortunately, it has come on right now. And with, with that, that we are sitting here and uh, discussing this, there have been lots of the concert paper refers to Kali Dasanag, absolutely. Even further, I think in the 1880s, it was a German uh, political scientist who did mention about the Indo-Pacific as emerging. Now, most people think of the Mecklenders and the Eurasian, this thing. But this was also a very important concert which was there, but somehow never got traction. We're grateful today to have been having here very, very senior people, important people, Important in the sense that not just from the position they hold, but from the point of view of processes and ability to convert our thoughts into actions. Our Secretary East in the Ministry of External Affairs, Mr. Vijay Thakur Singh to my left. Our keynote speaker, Professor Yushido Soya to my extreme left. Mr. Miyamoto, the Director General of the Japan Foundation. Rick Rosso, the Senior Advisor and Vadhwani Chair in the Indo- U.S.-India Policy Studies at the CSIS in Washington, D.C., a very, very important location. It was between Sanjay and Miyamoto, Sanjay Pulipaka, senior fellow, and uh, Mr. Miyamoto who have put together this event. And if you look at the concept note and the list of topics, I think it does look into really looking forward into how this area, this part of the world, we use the word the gravity of global growth has shifted eastwards to the Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific is very, very broadly defined. The U.S. has one definition, we have another definition. Be it as it may, regions need not be very specific in there. It can be contextual also. The fact that as economic growth of this area has become the largest driving force of world economic growth, it has also brought forth, contrary to conventional wisdom, which says that economic interdependence leads to a lessening of tensions. That is the standard theory for a long, long time. The reality is that economic growth does not always lead to a reduction in tensions, can actually lead to an increase in tensions, because of your ability now to defend what you perceive to be your national interest is so much greater. Your ability to project yourself outwards is that much greater. And if you don't believe me, you'll have to just go to look at World War I, where Germany and United Kingdom were very large trading partners, and even when the war on the Eastern Front had broken, trains were carrying German goods to Russia and Russian goods to Germany. So just the assumption that you're economically independent won't fight with each other, I think is something which needs to be debunked. I'm not saying we should not have economic growth or interdependence. I'm merely saying don't look at it as a panacea. It, in short term, can actually cause. And it does cause because rising powers obviously have images of themselves as being wronged in the past and would want to rectify that wrong. Those wrongs could go back in the case of, say, 9-11. They refer to the fall of Kurtuba, Kordoba, a thousand years ago, in 900 years before the event. So it depends on how long your memory is. You want to rectify historical, what you perceive are historical wrongs. And therefore, it is best, therefore, to understand these things with a little more realistic vision, also understanding that as global powers shift their weights, it does, it may not lead to violent conflict, so I will not get to the trap business, but it definitely has a destabilizing effect. The revisionist powers obviously do not like the status quo. The status quo's powers will obviously like to extend the status quo as much as possible. And some of us, like in India, in between, want to be status quoist and yet rise at the same time. It's, it is a, they're thin, they're very difficult lines to follow, not an easy way to go through. Let me not take more time. 
and let me request actually i've done the speaking before i should have spoken afterwards but let me refer to our two main organizers simya mato to tell us about the concept paper to tell us about the vision and then sanjeev paripaka uh good morning everyone good morning Uh, my name is Kaoru Miyamoto. I'm a director of General Japan Foundation New Day. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say this conference is for the young scholars. So uh, I know there is a big names in front, except me, but you don't have to get the pressure. This is your chance to, you know, uh, present your research, and don't get pressure. Take this opportunity as much as you can. Well, uh, I prepared so I could. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, that this is my privilege to address here today at the Young Scholars uh, in the Indo-Pacific Political Security and Economic Dimensions. I'd like to thank Nehru Memorial Museum and Library for giving us this opportunity for hosting this conference and for all the facilities which will. undoubtedly highly contributed to success of this conference thank you very much i wish to take this opportunity to welcome the esteemed delegates and the professors from japan and india to of course the young scholars and young researchers for spending their valuable time to discuss about the japan uh, indo pacific today especially uh, ms vijay takur singh is my pronunciation good ah oh. Secretary Minister from Ex- External Affairs in India and Mr Shakti Singh Director Nehru Memorial Museum uh, Museum and the Library for joining us today and also special thanks to Sanjay Plimpaka whose effort leads to this conference be a reality thank you very much as an organization foreign foreign culture center with the Japan Foundation primary focused on activities that help promote japanese studies in india as japan foundation we originally supported bilateral relation mostly in like supporting japanese research in india the relation japan and india however in recent years only the research in bilateral countries cannot capture the real world we need to conduct global research with broader perspectives the japan has japan foundation has been hosting uh, uh has been focusing on nurturing uh, young researchers till last year uh we had a small conference uh, three or four times a year but this year we have decided to have one big conference in a larger scale because we thought that a uh, larger conference like this would hold more researchers at once and the uh, youngest college can create wider network and also that at the same time we believe that the number of the senior scholars senior researchers who always give us uh, uh, adequate advice will increase and the uh, range of the advice will be expanded and we also uh, create a framework for application to young scholars young researchers from the overseas so this time we got uh, japanese and korean researcher thank you very, very much for joining us today and uh, of course i'd like to mention about uh, uh, professor soya is a very famous uh, professor from japan where this is uh, one of the very big achievement that we could receive him here today so the primary purpose of this conference is to support the young researchers today here so i'd like to uh, mention about three things to the young young youngsters the first thing is uh, to value the originality of your own research the content of the presentation must not be equal to the wikipedia right <laughs> which you can easily find in the internet please value what you own research originality is for that this is very important to touch what class researchers you see here today so please do you know please do not study only in the narrow world 
See, open your eyes to the outer world. The present era is connected to, by the internet, so you can easily see the research content uh, by uh, in a world top class researchers. So you use, please use the internet, and of course you can uh, actively utilize this conference to to make your network too. And the second thing I'd like to mention about is uh, please have clear goal for yourself, for your research. What kind of place you want to work, what, what kind of research you want to be in the future. Please imagine and think what you have to do for it, you know, what you have to do for that. The Japan Foundation, we expect you to become uh, like opinion reader or the intellectuals who became like influential researchers to the people or the government. I want you to be like that. So please make your goal clear. And then the last thing I would like to mention about is uh, please don't be afraid to make mistakes. Failure is a source of growth. So, uh, and uh, fear is permitted when you're young. I cannot make mistakes anymore. <laughs> but you, you can make mistakes and it's your, you know, uh, yes, because you're the young. So, uh, if you have any doubt, please don't, you know, to, to, don't hesitate to ask. This is a great opportunity you can ask to the specialist and speak out what you think, what you thought. So have originality and have your clear goal and don't afraid to make mistakes. Please go forward. Well, uh, I'd like to again thank uh, to the Institute of uh, Nehru Memorial Museum and Library for kindly hosting this conference and the staff for making so hard to setting this up. And I'd like to thank the delegates for visiting here today, for uh, taking your time. Uh, sorry. Uh, and last, not but the least, I'd like to thank everyone here who have taken time out of your busy schedule today, uh, joining us this program. And I hope uh, this conference will be reproductive and success successful one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Garrison. May I now request our senior fellow Sanjay Pulipaka. Good morning. Uh, it's uh, good to see a very, good Thank you. a very good turnout on a cold and a cloudy Delhi morning. Uh, let me at the outset thank Madam Secretary. Uh, we are looking forward to your address and uh, greetings to friends uh, from Japan Foundations and Professor Soya uh, from Japan and uh, Rick Rosso for being present here. Rick Bhai, as we call him here, and deeply grateful to Sri Shakti Sinha. Uh, while I have a longer history with uh, Young Scholars Forums, uh, I must say that uh, Shakti Sinha ji has been consistently and yet gently nudging us to uh, incorporate young voices, not only in this platform, but various other platforms that we have been uh, organizing. I know this sounds like a vote of thanks, but this is an inaugural, so <laughs> I won't continue with this. But the broader objective of this program is to facilitate young scholars to present their work, reflect on their work, network with people, uh, senior scholars. Uh, I believe, uh, uh, and that will hopefully help you uh, get fellowships and other things, uh, not only with Japan Foundation, but also with other uh, uh, organizations as well. Uh, we will discuss about Indo-Pacific, uh, the various notions of Indo-Pacific, what is Indo-Pacific, power shifts, economic integration, conflicts, non-traditional security issues, nuclear issues, whole range of gamut of issues are present. I'm looking forward to uh, productive, vigorous uh, conversations. Thank you. Over to you, sir. That was very short and sweet, yeah. Sanjay, <laughs> because I did the speaking my mistake. Uh, I was just this morning seeing a video on YouTube a talk by this historian Adam Tooze on his new book, Crashed, at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. And the person there, like me, made two requests to people. One is that, you know, there are seats in the inner row also. Everybody need not sit on the outer row. Here, of course, now we are popular in the inner row. Second is that everybody sits on the seats closest to the door. 
as a matter of strategic positioning i think <laughs> so anyway just but very good words of advice karo san thank you that was very useful the wikipedia part i particularly like was there is a tendency to do quick research not always a good idea make your mistakes much bigger mistake is wikipedia that is to me an unforgivable mistake everything else mistakes are forgiven wikipedia is not forgiven let me now get pressure to request uh, vijay thakur singh ji as secretary east in the ministry of uh, foreign affairs looking at this east asia and south asia very a very important regions for us to give us service uh, good a very very good morning let me begin by thanking uh, shakti sena ji for organizing this uh, uh, the discussion on the indo pacific political security and economic dimensions i want to thank japan foundation kauro uh, kauro miyamoti as well as uh, sanjay uh, sanjay for their words as we begin the session we of course look forward to the uh, intervention of professor soya who would bring a lot of uh, i am sure intellectual depth to our discussions but let me speak from the point of view of a practitioner and in terms of how india sees the indo pacific region uh india if you look at it as uh, is a nation of seafarers with a long maritime history in which the indian traders they carried their goods they carried their ideas they carried their culture to distant lands including the indo pacific now the concept indo pacific as shakti ji was mentioning is a concept which has been in usage for a while and but what has changed in the recent period is uh, since the term found currency some time back is the world around us there is a rapidly changing world around us and what we have found that in india that even our engagement with the region uh, indo pacific has been intensifying for india the indo pacific is a primary area of interest and when we look at when we say talk about an area of interest we look at it stretching from the shores of africa to the americas and we do look at a range of diverse indian issues indian security issues indian trade issues in the right across this region even in the western pacific theater why is this happening because if you look at india we are looking at a we moved from a look east policy to an act east policy and by extension it meant the whole region of the indo pacific you look at the annunciation of india's vision of the indo pacific which was done by prime minister modi uh, at the shangri la dialogue in june 2018 what are the basic features of the vision prime minister spoke about inclusiveness and openness with asean centrality and unity at the heart of the new indo pacific region prime minister also outlined india's approach to the region and in fact to the world in very positive and in a very uh, engaging uh, manner in a constructive manner he spoke of five s's which is samman samman means respect sambad which means dialogue sahyog which means cooperation shanti peace and samriddhi prosperity so these were the five principles which prime minister enunciated when he spoke at the shangri la dialogue on india's vision to the indo pacific he also called for a rule based order in the region which would apply equally to all countries and all nations irrespective of their whether their size or their demonstrated power and he also said that the rule based uh, order should also apply to global commons because that is very essential that we have rules in the global commons he reiterated india's commitment to uphold the international rule of law and he while he called for prevention of maritime crimes preserving marine uh, marine ecology preparedness against disaster and a prospering blue economy prime minister emphasized on the importance of equal access to global com- commons and for freedom of navigation and unimpeded economic activity and trade india's continuing endeavor is to bring up uh, to bring up the issues of indo pacific 
in various forms. We speak about Indo-Pacific in different foras, and if you look at it, the concept of Indo-Pacific has been getting a greater and greater resonance across the world. Speaking of China, China has recently it announced a policy of free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, the strategy of YOPS. Then you look at United States. United States has come out with its free and open Indo-Pacific policy. Australia has laid down principles in its white paper in 2017, which speak about uh, how all of us have been talking about Indo-Pacific. It has to be a free area. Uh, there has to be unimpeded ag uh, flow of goods. There has to be freedom of navigation. So those are principles which are finding greater and greater acceptability as the discussion uh, goes on around Indo-Pacific. ASEAN itself has now followed suit. Indonesia spoke about the Indo-Pacific, and within the ASEAN there is discussions and consultations on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, therefore, if you look at it, Indo-Pacific is a tangible and a meaningful now assuming uh, um, aspect of being a very tangible and a meaningful collaborative, uh, uh, collaborative uh, uh, platform for countries to engage in. Now, what are the dimensions of the Indo-Pacific? Firstly, what is it that we speak about in the Pacific? What are the issues that we look at? And what are the, maybe the concerns that we have? Firstly, as I mentioned, that there is a change in the world around us. The strategic landscape in the 21st century has, is very different from the order established in the post-World War era in 1945. If you look at it, and Shakti Sinaji mentioned, the gravity of the global power, economic power, is moving from the Pacific Atlantic to the Indo-Pacific region, which is home to the large emerging economies with high GDP growth. You look at China, China's fast economic growth, combined with, if I'd say, with the very rapid economic growth of India, along with the steady growth of Indonesia, South Korea, and the presence of other large economies like Japan and Australia in Asia, are shifting the global activity and the global uh, 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 intensification on global in economic engagement to the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, this is also, what is also happening is that with the growth of the economies, these countries, countries in the region, are spending more on military than they were previously, and that also means the growing military strength of the countries in the region. Now, what is the countries in the region looking for? The countries in the region want to safeguard, uh, they have a common desire to safeguard converging security interests in the region. What do most of the countries want? If you look at the region, they want to engage with each other, but as they engage with China, they want constructive engagement with China, but yet neither wants China. None of the countries want China to be the dominant power in Asia, and all are suspicious of China's expanding presence in the Indo-Pacific region. Hence, there is clearly a range of issues confronting the Indo-Pacific. They include both traditional and non-traditional security issues. You have the maritime boundary disputes. You have terrorism. Uh, they include both tra traditional and non-traditional security issues, such as maritime boundary disputes, terrorism, piracy, environmental sustainability, connectivity, freedom of navigation, and all of these demand innovative, institutional, informal, regional, and global solutions. When you pursue uh, uh, issues like connectivity, investment, and maritime cooperation in the region, these are very important. But yet, uh, all of them have strategic impl implications, particularly when you're talking about trans, uh, transnational connectivity. They, there are issues there. There are issues when we, we believe that these transnational uh, connectivity issues should have a broad con consensus and be on mutually uh, agreed norms, which respect sovereignty and territorial integrity. Similarly, if you look at investments, what is happening in the investment domain, you, you 
have to see that there is issues of debt sustainability and you need to look at those issues. Similarly, when you look at the maritime domain, you need to work towards preserving uh, integrity, inviability of uh, a country's sovereignty. Those are basic premises which we deal with as we look at issues relating to whether connectivity, investment, or maritime domain. India engages in the, as India engages in the Indo-Pacific, it is our view that the most important factor for stability in the region is an inclusive uh, approach. That is why Prime Minister spoke about the vision of Sagar, which is security and growth for all in the region, and that has become the guiding light for India's maritime engagement in the Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean and beyond, and it is the basic uh, pillar of our um, approach towards the Indo-Pacific region. The shared aim uh, of prosperity and development of Indo-Pacific depends upon a great deal of connectivity, as I mentioned earlier. India's look east policy, what did it do? It deepened our engagement with ASEAN on trade and investment. We uh, are looking at connectivity, not only in terms of trade investment, but also in terms of physical connectivity, digital connectivity, people-to-people -people connectivity. You, we engage on these connectivity issues not only through, uh, through bilateral uh, conversations, but also through regional mechanisms, whether it is BIMSTEC, whether it is IORA, whether it is SARC, whether it is BBIN. So we do look at various arrangements when we look at connectivity. Some of our connectivity uh, initiatives, they include the trilateral uh, india myanmar Thailand Highway, which we look at the possibility, we are looking at uh, its extension to Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. We are looking at the Kaladan Multimodal Transport Project. You are looking at the Re Thiman Road Project. So physical connectivity is going on even in the air, air connectivity. If you look at it, 28 cities of India uh, are, uh, are open to all ASEAN countries and they can fly in as many uh, flights as they want to these 28 countries. We have a new open skies uh, policy under our new civil aviation policy under which countries beyond 500 kilometers can fly as many flights to India. Uh, we have security cooperation in the region. We are contributing to discussions in the ARF, as ADMM Plus, expanded ASEAN Maritime Forum. You look at the Malabar exercise that we have been holding annually since 1992, and now Japan is a permanent uh, invitee since 2015. We also have uh, discussions in the quadrilateral, trilateral mechanisms, and uh, we engage with a range of countries and players in the region. Uh, for us, the safety and security of maritime traffic through the oceans is very, very important. We are working with countries in building up logistic um, infrastructure in Sri Lanka, Maldives, Mauritius, Seychelles. Similarly, Australia has decided to upgrade its engagement with India. It is opening a new consulate in Calcutta. U.S. has renamed its Naval Command as the Indo-Pacific Command, uh, and uh, we are engaging with in, uh, in India, U.S., Japan. We are engaging as India, Australia, Japan on various Indo-Pacific policy approaches. We even have discussions with ASEAN. So what I'm saying is that we are looking at the region. We are looking at building institutional blocks as we construct and look forward to an Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region, which is uh, peaceful, progressive, and inclusive. We have the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. We have the uh, Regional Cooperation Agreement on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery, the RECAP, and we have a cooperative mechanism for the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, SOM mechanism in Southeast Asia, all of them being platforms for exchange of views. Lastly, I can say I've just, inter uh, I mean, of course, I've just outlined the broad contours given the time of, uh, uh, of India's engagement in an increasingly complex and uncertain uh, yet interdependent world in the Indo-Pacific. We are conscious that we are in a period of major global transformation where many of our earlier assumptions about the world order are changing rapidly. But the interlinked destiny of the people living in the region is vital for countries like India. 
and it's important that we work together to avail of the opportunities and for solving the multiple challenges because for us and for all, a free, open, prosperous and inclusive Indo-Pacific region serves the long-term interest of all stakeholders of the region and the world as large and with enhanced global interest and focus on Indo-Pacific. I'm sure that your research in this area will continue as uh, uh, Professor as, uh, uh, Miki, uh, Miyamoto said, let us, be, let us look at various aspects, bring in as much thought process and ideas, uh, original ones, very much we are looking forward to it. With these words, I once again thank all of you, and it's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for giving us this broad outline of the Indian position and going beyond just Indian position, how you're working with our partners in it. We now request Professor Choya uh, to bring his perspective onto the subject. With your Ah, yeah, she has to go for a meeting. I got a message in between. So, thank you very, very much for sparing your time. Thank you. So, and hopefully we'll see you again many times. Absolutely. Thank you. While she was speaking, I got the message that she has a meeting with the minister at 11 o'clock. <laughs> so I didn't know how to interrupt her, but gently I did. But yes, Professor, yes. because uh, we are... Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, first, I'd like to thank organizers, Japan Foundation and the Indian counterparts. Sorry, I, I cannot pronounce exactly, uh, so I will skip naming. Uh, uh, but uh, I really... This is my f uh, third uh, visit to, to India and uh, New Delhi. And before coming here, I had the opportunity and privilege to uh, talk to college students, university students of Presidency University in Kolkata, uh, both undergraduate and uh, graduate <laughs> students. Uh, again, thanks to the arrangement by the Japan Foundation. And I, 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 as I'm a university professor, so I love to talk to uh, <laughs> you know, students. And, uh, and it's really eye-opening, often the case. And, uh, and talking to students, I think, gives me uh, some clues to uh, the, the important part of uh, any country society. I often do it with Korean students, and which uh, gives me a basic source of information how, for instance, civil society relationship is important, despite what's happening between the governments. And, uh, and uh, it's a clue to the future direction of you know, I, I think your country. And, uh, and I'm, well, this has become a cliche to say that uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. And uh, you have to be cautious because there are problems. Uh, but just talking to those students uh, convinces me that the future is not necessarily uh, bad. And, uh, well, uh, just, uh, I'm sorry to miss uh, ma uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, I wanted to say, her, uh, say this to her, uh, that uh, this was a beautiful and very excellent, uh, very rich, uh, I think, uh, address. And what I wanted to tell her was, if a Japanese government official would have read it by replacing the term India with Japan, perhaps exactly the same more or less the same speech, you know, uh, could, could have been given by a Japanese government representative. And I think that tells how like-minded we are uh, in terms of, uh, the, you know, appreciation of issues and the sort of future prospect and the kind of region we'd like to see to form in years ahead. And uh, so, so, I mean, this, this is exactly why we have to, I think, cooperate. And, of course, uh, the India-Japan cooperation uh, still suffers from, I mean, our kind of uh, failure in cultivating, you know, natural areas of cooperation. But I think uh, uh, there are enough reasons as well as logic, you know, why, why we do have to cooperate. And in order to... Uh, I hope uh, uh, this may eventually come out from exchanges between young scholars. Uh, 
and in, in this you know uh, one day conf uh, two day two day conference in fact uh, uh, ex extends into tomorrow and uh, in order to do that of course uh, still uh, I mean the need is there for us to look into sort of details of you know uh, what's happening in terms of uh, the the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific regional uh, developments, and the Indo-Pacific is still a concept in the formation, and uh, there are somewhat different views depending on the subregions or, or countries, and this is how I'd like to start my uh, this initial address to to just uh, to go to review some of the you know views from each you know, player in the region. And naturally, I would need to start with my own country. And m many of us uh, would like to say the Indo-Pacific is a kind of idea initiated by Prime Minister Abe. And uh, I don't know whether it's correct or not, but chronologi chro chronologically, uh, there, there is some, some to this. And because the first time that Prime Minister Abe used the concept to connect the Pacific and the, and the Indian Ocean was when he visited India in the year 2007. And he gave a speech at your national, how do you call it, parliament? parliament. And uh, the title of the speech was Confluence of the Two Seas. And uh, there he talked, he, he talked about the importance of you know, thinking of the region by connecting both, both oceans in, in India and uh, and, and in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. And, uh, but some somewhat controversial aspect of this initiative uh, was, I, I would like to say was, because things began to change uh, these, these, these uh, months, uh, uh, was, uh, it, it was um, con conceived as a China strategy, somewhat, somewhat explicitly. And uh, when Prime Minister Abe came back uh, in 2012, only a day or two after the inauguration of the second uh, Abe cabinet, uh, he contributed a sort of uh, small piece uh, to Project Syndicate, uh, I think a Prague-based, you know, internet sort of, you know, uh, 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 how, do, how, how do you call it, uh, where, where, you know, world-renowned leaders and opinion makers, you know, contribute their opinions. And the title of that uh, contribution was Asia's Democratic Security Diamond. And, uh, and by, by Security Diamond, he meant a relationship among, uh, you know, uh, India, Australia, U.S., and Japan. And after that, this has become a somewhat a catchword of, uh, in explaining Prime Minister Abe's regional, uh, you know, uh, approach. And so, so China element was uh, very explicit. And in this piece, uh, it was all the more sort of uh, clear that just, just uh, revisiting what he said, he even said, he talked about, you know, uh, peace, stability, freedom of navigation, and so forth. But, but uh, after that, he said, the South China Sea seems to set to become a Lake Beijing. Very, very strong word. <laughs> very strong word. And which analyst say will be to China what the Sea of Okhotsk was to the Soviet Union during the Cold War. <laughs> and uh, maybe, maybe this is too much <laughs> to say, perhaps, <laughs> but this tells the kind of original sort of, you know, uh, instinct uh, of uh, our leadership uh, in starting, in beginning to talk about the Indo-Pacific. But to, to, to yeah, as, as I said, I use the past tense uh, because, as, as you may be aware, our government started to sort of relax this uh, China dimension uh, starting from sometime last year. And, uh, and, and so they used to call it Indo-Pacific strategy, but now uh, they stopped using the term strategy. And uh, the intention is, of course, to, to sort of uh, deprive the explicit China uh, you know, uh, aspect from, from this. And, and uh, of course, people are t suspecting, you know, what, what made him change. Uh, and, uh, and I think logical, logical summation would be as long as you 
put emphasis on this China strategy aspect too much. Uh, it is not necessarily easy to, to get support and cooperation from other regional countries, and particularly ASEAN countries, uh, which are not very interested in you know, standing up against China uh, explicitly. And there, I think there is some tendency in India as well. And, of course, uh, in Japan as well, uh, views are divided. So, so therefore, I, I personally welcome this change because I, from this point, we can start to make it a truly a regional collaborative sort of scheme. And, uh, and so, so, so that's how this concept evolved as far as, I think, Japanese approach uh, goes. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, Africa is often mentioned, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Shin also mentioned from Africa to, to the United Nations. And uh, Prime Minister Abe made a reference to Africa in a conference we, which we call TCAD, uh, and uh, this is a Tokyo International Conference. Uh, of African development, yeah. And uh, this is held in Tokyo or Okinawa previously. And, uh, but uh, this, is the, this was the first case uh, where this TCAD was held in Africa, Nairobi, in, in 2016. And there he talked about connecting Asia and Africa uh, on top of uh, in, in Indian Ocean and the Pacific. So, so the regional kind of uh, you know, area extended uh, in, uh, to, to come to, to Africa. And uh, so, so that's a new development since uh, 2016. And if I may uh, come to the, the arguments from Australia. Uh, Australia is one of the countries which started to talk about this concept at the earlier stage. And uh, starting from around 2012, uh, uh, Australian government you know, compiled a new Asia you know, vision uh, strategy around this time. And uh, as a part of this attempt, uh, they started to argue that uh, at, at the time of the rise of China and India, mostly as economic powers, it is all the natural for them to think of regional strategy you know, uh, by looking at both you know, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And of course, if you, if you are in Australia, uh, to the east of uh, Australia, the Pacific, and to the west, this is the Indian Ocean. So, you know, ge geographically, uh, this was uh, somewhat natural for Australians to begin to think of, you know, their kind of ocean surrounding them in, uh, in terms of connecting, you know, both of these, both of these oceans. And, uh, but very... Uh, this, this is not uniquely Australian, but these, these views are existent in some other countries too. But in thinking of this broader region, you know, by looking at both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, uh, there are sources of concerns. I mean, this, this uh, has, to be a, uh, has to be a stable region, of course. But in order to achieve stability, you know, Australians uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, this has been a tradition of Australian regional uh, approach since some time ago. I mean, they start with problems and uh, identifying problems. And, and uh, they, they think about means to solve those. And uh, that's why, for instance, uh, Pre uh, Prime Minister Rudd, uh, when he initiated the Pacific sort of concept, the approach was, was very much European, you know, starting with the identification problems and, and then talk about means. And uh, ASEAN countries felt very much at a loss because ASEAN way was excluded, because ASEAN way would, would by any means be, you know, uh, efficient if you identify problems as such. And uh, so there was a harsh conflict between uh, RAD approach to this uh, and ASEAN's uh, approach. And uh, so, so somewhat, somewhat reminiscent of that is this, I think, Australian approach to this Indo-Pacific. And one of the elements of instability, potential instability, that they identified in the process of talking about in the Pacific was conflict between Japan and China. And uh, so, so Sino-Japanese you know, uh, relations should, should, should be more or less stable. Otherwise, in the Pacific, it would not be stable. So conceptually, this is somewhat contrary to 
premise of his initial you know, intention. And so there is conceptual discrepancy, uh, in my view, between the original version of Japanese you know, concept of the Indo-Pacific and the Australian. And, uh, but Australia-Japan cooperation is considered to be very critical and, uh, as part of security dialogue. So, so, so there was some inconsistency in our strategic approach, in my view, as, if I may say so as a scholar. Maybe government official would never say this. But, uh, and, uh, so, so this is uh, Japan and Australia. And if you come to the United States, I uh, will listen to uh, uh, Mr. Rosso more extens extensively after this. And, but U.S. also started to talk about this concept in, uh, around 2012, uh, about the same time as Australians, uh, you know, started to talk about this. And this was Obama period. And in talking of a rebalancing and the pivoting to, to the Pacific, they, they were simultaneously talking about Indian Ocean. So pivoting to Asia meant to cover up to India and uh, in Obama's version of rebalancing. And uh, And in 2012, uh, Secretary Clinton uh, gave a speech in Perth, Australia. Uh, she was addressing the inaugural meeting of the U.S. Uh, what's the name of that? Uh, just a minute. Excuse me. Uh, lost it. Anyway, there, there is a U.S. center uh, of Indo-Pacific or something, which is headed by uh, Gordon, Gordon uh, Korea specialist. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I may look young, but I'm getting old. I, I tend to forget <laughs> uh, things these days, these easy names. Sorry, <laughs> this happens to my students and all the things. And, but anyway, so uh, Clinton addressed that inaugural you know, conference, and there he used the term you know, the Indo-Pacific. And the opening of the U.S. center in Perth, you know, facing the Indian Ocean, I think uh, was indicative of U U.S. You know, getting to beginning to think of, you know, in terms of uh, the Indo-Pacific by connecting uh, two oceans. So U.S. also came out uh, uh, relatively early, and uh, and also, uh, you know, U.S. Pacific Command uh, also started to talk about the Asia Pacific about the same time, and. Uh, uh, and Admiral uh, Rocklear, I think, and uh, also uh, Admiral uh, Harris, who is an am ambassador to South Korea, you know, they, they were using these terms in the, you know, uh, uh, Congress testimonies uh, for almost annually from, from these years. And as was mentioned, uh, Pacific Command was renamed into the Indo-Pacific uh, Command just recently. So, so this, this was an evolutionary process. And... Uh, and in talking about the you know, U.S. military uh, engagement in, to this region, what they have in mind is, of course, China. So, so this was a kind of strategic balancing against China uh, when the U.S. military it, uses this term. And, uh, but the Indo-Pacific concept has, you know, of course, differences among countries, but, uh, but has, uh, also differences in terms of uh, functional you know, sort of uh, areas security, economic, and others. That's the uh, subtitle for, the, for this conference. And uh, so security-wise, of course, there are lots of concerns about China. And those messages are coming from American military very clearly. And, uh, and, but economically, you know, fighting with China is, is, is going to be a losing game for everybody. And so there are some elements of competition, but uh, there, there should be some areas where you know, interests converge, you know, between China and, 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 uh, and other countries. But also, but in the economic area alone, uh, you know, for instance, China has two sort of means to, to, to uh, practice, uh, you know, uh, their uh, assistance projects uh, under the uh, brand name of uh, Belt and Road. And one is uh, Silk Road Fund, and the other is AIIB. Yeah, AIB is, is a, they have members, members from, from European countries. And uh, so they have to uh, accept uh, international standards, so to speak, in, in selecting projects and putting money into those projects. 
So, so, so that's a very interesting, I think, case to see how Chinese engagement with regional economic you know, necessities will evolve uh, on the basis of, uh, you know, engaging others as well as being engaged by, by others. Uh, but Silk Road Fund is, is a typical sort of tied aid. So they can use it in whatever way they want, and the most aids are tied. So Chinese companies are getting those monies, and they are doing uh, whatever they want. So, so, so picture of economic uh, aspect is also very much mixed uh, in, in those terms. And, uh, but uh, I think a dichotomy between security and, and the economy, I think, is, is always going to remain uh, in the evolving process of this Indo-Pacific concept as well as strategies uh, by by Indian uh, Indo-Pacific countries, and uh, and ASEAN, uh, as I said briefly, uh, when the kind of China strategy aspect was explicit, ASEAN countries' response was, "We are at a loss, and uh, we don't want to put into into a place where we have to choose size you know, between you know China." And, and America and Japan and others. And uh, so uh, some, somebody, when I attended some conference in Singapore, uh, some, question, uh, some question was, uh, he, what was the exact term? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, somebody used the term paradigm clash, uh, paradigm clash uh, between the Belt and Road and the Indo-Pacific. And if, if it is a paradigm clash, there is no place for ASEAN. And uh, so that's, that's ASEAN's initial response. They, so they have tended to like Australian approach. And, uh, and, uh, and there, there was some you know, uh, in, interest in, uh, among ASEAN experts to, to develop uh, their uh, ties with Australia in advancing, in trying to be part of this uh, regional, regional dynamism. And... Uh, I have my section on India, but uh, I, I'm not going to say that here. And uh, I, I leave it to uh, Indian experts. What is India's, you know? Uh, uh, per what, is what is the Japanese view of India? Japanese view of India. As I said, very similar. <laughs> and uh, hope those similarities will be, you know, uh, taken advantage of uh, by uh, policy planners. And uh, difference may be. I don't know, India may be more divided than Japan, perhaps, uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, thinking about China. And uh, I was told in Kolkata that most of the college students, they don't have any anti-China kind of sentiments. And college professors, some of them are former communists, I was told, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and they tell students uh, about China in a very benign way. And, and when, I, I, before I gave a talk, the lecture, uh, uh, you know, uh, a professor who organized this, you know, class, these classes told me uh, very frankly, you know, uh, a few of my colleagues are telling my students uh, before your lecture, be prepared for partially anti-China lectures, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but which was not the case as far as I, I was concerned. So they may have been disappointed. And, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but anyway, I, I think uh, China is always a divisive issue for any country uh, you know, in, in many ways. So how to, how to construct a con reasonable consensus, comfortable consensus in each country is, is not easy, let alone among countries. So I think that's one of the reasons, backgrounds, why this concept will remain as an evolving concept uh, for many years to come. And, uh, and, but one good thing for scholars is that as long as you put this uh, subject matter in your proposal, you get funding. <laughs> and, uh, so it's, it's, and maybe this, this conference is, is one of them. And, uh, and so this, I think this concept will remain as a relevant concept for many years to come. And so, the, so particularly young people to be involved in talking about this is, is very, very important. And I, I really hope uh, things uh, which would be fresh even to our senior scholars will come out, come out in sessions for today and tomorrow.
So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very, very much. I had spoken half of my chairman's remarks when I realized that I was speaking too early. Let me complete the rest of my chairman's <laughs> remarks now. And we'll move automatically to the second session. We won't take a break. So, Rick, give me five minutes and then you're on. Uh, one, I'm glad uh, that uh, Vijay Thakur is a very important point about India being a seafaring nation. This is something which we have lost from a collective memory in the last century or so, not before that. Enough historical evidence, and I'll just cite a few, to see that, show that we were a very seafaring nation. One, of course, that we were trading extensively with all over the world. You find lots of Roman coins being found even now on the east coast of India, not the west coast of India, Tamil Nadu, Arakmedu, so many places. You can say that, okay, we were trading, but we were not the traders. Valid point. Again, e evidence has emerged that about 2,000 years ago, roughly at the time that Jesus Christ's time, there was a strong Indian Buddhist community in the city of Alexandria, which is not surprisingly, because from the northwest, the Greeks were there. Alexandria, till 50 years ago, was a Greek city. Alexandria, though in Egypt, has been a Greek city. For the first time, now they don't have any Greeks anymore. And therefore, and it was an entrepot, a big center for trade, and we were very linked with that. And I'll just give four or five examples from history to show how we were a seafaring nation. The second very good example I see is uh, that when the Portuguese went to Malacca early in the 16th century, the largest community of traders in Malacca were Indians. And Malacca till today has that Pillai community from Tamil Nadu. Even today it has that community, you know. They're not like the Pernakan who merged very much, but it is there as a distinct community. Then if I take example of the, a Portuguese priest called Father Godino, who was in Goa, at the time when the Portuguese crown decided to gift Bombay as dowry, when the, when the Catherine of Braganza was getting married to the British crown, British crown prince, and the Portuguese in in Goa were worried about it. They didn't want to give up Bombay. Even though Bombay was not a port then, but they could visualize its future importance. So Gudino was sent overland. They say if he goes by sea, the British will come to know about his mission. He was sent overland from India to Portugal. So from he set sail from somewhere in Gujarat. He had collected hundis in Surat. Those hundis he could encash for cash, Basra and beyond Basra. So this is a very extensive trading relationship. And trading relationship of this kind actually needs people who are familiar with each other, who trust each other. Because Hundi is a piece of paper. It's a legal fiction. And you're giving money in place of it. So it, it implies. When again, even before that, okay, I've jumped. My sequence is wrong. When Vasco da Gama was coming to India, from Zanzibar he picked up an Indian pilot, Majid, who brought him to Calicut, just north of Calicut, Bepo, right? So an Indian was sitting there. Oh, he couldn't be an isolated Indian. It's very rare. These were the guys who knew the monsoon, the monsoon winds, and were going up and down. Throughout, Herat had Indian population when the British spies went there to probe the Iranian-Afghan border in the early part of the 19th century, 1806-1807, the siege of Herat. There were Indians in Herat. Indian currency was being used in Kazan in the 17th century, reports Josh Gormans, who's a very bad accent of mine, a Dutch historian who's written a book called The Rise and Fall of the Indo-Afghan Empires. So throughout history, if you see, and we were building boats. We were building ships for the Arabs. We were building ships for ourselves. We were building ships for the Royal Navy. Normally, a guy who builds ships knows something about the sea. You, know? you just don't build a ship. So we had had a very, very rich seafaring tradition. And therefore, we are very familiar with what is now the Indo-Pacific with the identification of two old Hindu temples in South China now, which have become Chinese temples now, but who have features which clearly established that these were Hindu temples. There was a community of Tamil merchants staying in Guizhou and other parts of South China. So this is an area which is not strange to us. The west coast of East Coast Africa to the east coast of the Far East is an area which Indians have always been extremely familiar with. To the extent if you go to Java, and I've read a book in Java which says that Ganesha was a Javanese god which the Indians have adopted. 
So you can argue with it. It's nothing wrong because Ganesha does not appear in our mythology till quite late in the day. So I, there could be something to it. I'm not saying it's right. I'm merely saying that the kind of interaction that we've had has been very, very dense for a very, very long time. And therefore, if we have interest in this region, it is with a larger vision in mind also and not necessarily hege hegemonic intentions. But this area is changing very, very rapidly. The fear that people have is that we don't have a security framework in place, a security architecture in place. And therefore, inadvertently, you could lead to a situation. Fear, fear, that's a fear, fear is not unfounded. But I guess the stage for the level of trust required to create a level of trust or the level of fear, the flip sides to the same thing, required to build such an architecture is obviously absent. And absent that, I guess what we'll have to look for are more flexible platforms which are not rigid. See, the minute you have a rigid platform, it's us against them kind of a thing. And yes, we are not looking for a fight with China. We are not looking for a conflict with China. But definitely we need to hedge our bets kind of a thing. So you cooperate with China as much as possible. But where obviously cooperation is not possible, you are prepared to defend your own interest. And so it's a flexible, it cannot be a rigid kind of a framework. The China strategy, no, it should not become a China strategy because it immediately puts China on the offensive in that sense. Because between the thin line between defense and offense, and which is why Prime Minister Modi in Singapore's speech was very, very clear when he talked about it being inclusive and not directed against somebody. He also wanted it to be a rules-based thing. So, you know, you're balancing the two. You're not going to say against this, but it will be the same. Yes, views on China, Professor Soya, are conflicted. In your own country also, they are conflicted in a different kind of a way. Are you prepared to go nuclear? Are you pre is pre Japan prepared to scrap that part of its constitution? which prohibits it from deploying its armed forces outside the country of Japan. It's not a question of only about defense force in the country. It has come into the picture only because of the rise of China. If China was not a threat. So, being conflicted with China and Calcutta would be a particularly good or bad example. The Communist Party split in 1963 after the Indochina War into a pro-Russia and a pro-China faction. So, we've always had this somewhat conflicted attitude. None of us are looking for a fight. None of us want a fight with China. But obviously, it's something we can't ignore. And therefore, in the AIB, which has been mentioned by everybody, India is the second largest shareholder after China. We are, we are comfortable with it. You know, as I said, if you want platforms of cooperation, AIIB is a rules-based order. People thought, but it does follow the norms of the global norms for lending, due diligence, etc., how, what it does in the future, I'm not too sure. But obviously, in all this, countries are yet to take their final positions and will keep on evolving. Australia is a classical case in point. When Kevin Rudd and party are on one side, things change. When the other side, things, you know, it's actually a very flip-flop which happens, which obviously makes it difficult for others to come to a conclusion on how much can Australia be a part of the whole discussion. But the whole idea, I think, is, and this is just one forum, we get young scholars. Sanjay was right. I like to try my best. We try our best to get young scholars involved. So whenever we do big conferences, we always insist that 10, 15, 20 percent, two, three speakers should be those who haven't had a platform till now. If they don't get a platform, they don't become good. You know, so you can't hold that against, inexperience hold that against people. This will continue to engage us for some time to come. I don't know about the funding, but Professor Soya, I'll be happy to get some funding. I wouldn't mind some funding <laughs> for such things. Because I think we need to understand the dynamics much, much better. We cannot be just reliant on newspaper reports and newspaper articles, important enough as they are, but they're only one step removed from Wikipedia. They're useful, they're not reliable. Because one, they lack conceptual frameworks. Two, they're very context-driven, and therefore... The moment you're not able to take one step backwards, you tend to trip up. So it is good to develop far more en engaged, intellectual engagement with the subject, look at different dimensions from the, not just the Indian perspective, but different Indian perspectives, different perspectives across the things, because the whole idea is that 
we want a peaceful world we want to grow but we want to grow in a peaceful environment we don't want to grow by stepping on people's toes how do you achieve that is not an easy thing because the moment you expand you're not expanding into vacuum maybe there are lags in the system where you can fill up the gaps but ultimately it is not the absolute numbers which count but the relative numbers which count if europe is not growing or europe is not decreasing if it is not growing relatively it is losing out so in that sense you are definitely not easy to not to step on toes but as much as possible to better understand each other i have thank you very much i have done my bit i would now request we had professor soya who i see has done his phd from university of michigan at ann arbor and i see that rick you have also studied in state of michigan, michigan. No, it's not the lo- what what state is it it's not No, it's not the Lone Star State. It's not the Granite State. What state is it? Oh, the Mitten State. Okay. Like a, a mitten. <laughs> so. We don't have anything quite so catchy. No. It's the cold state. It's the cold state. <laughs> I can say that when I went to when I went to Ann Arbor. No, no, Michigan. He's from. He studied at the Grand Valley uh, University in Michigan. Michigan is is at uh, three days ago was colder than the Arctic. So you can imagine how cold it place can be. Rick has spent a long time. with india in different formats in different places and i think rick is very well placed today he is the vadwani chair at the csis csis for those who don't know is a very very important think tank in the city of washington dc k street if i remember correctly and it has produced amazing amount of works in different subjects that is of use used to even on the indo pacific we're discussing on the uh, OB, bri they have done a lot of factual work easy to come to judgments getting facts are important and rick russo is part of that work to help generate in a body of knowledge for the rest of us then to talk about mr rick russo over to you great thank you and thank you again for having me here it really is a treat to get to speak to uh, to a new audience folks that uh, i don't think i've had the opportunity to engage many of you before um so uh, i'll offer the us perspective in terms of uh, free and open indo pacific and how we got to where we are today um what we're thinking about uh in terms of our own strategy and uh, a bit on US India relations and how we view that from Washington um first of all you know this concept about you know uh work towards peace how do we create a stable environment that we can all thrive in um what we haven't really touched on too much is what are China's intentions a lot of this conversation has been about China they are militarizing lines of trade they were you know between cyber hacking and other things stealing advanced uh, military equipment and technology um so while we may be you know supporting each other and preparing for peace there are other things that we see out there right now that we need to accommodate from the question is have we been reacting quickly enough are we reacting in an appropriate manner now going back to the um the obama administration as was pointed out you know we had this pivot the rebalance and now we have the the articulation um which you know Japan kind of led with with the free and open indo pacific is it something new is it old wine in a new bottle you know what what is this thing and what is it reacting to first of all i'll say like india by and large has been out of step with our overall asia strategy president george w bush made a big bet on india as uh, trying to draw out as one of our top security partners in the region going so far as to for the first time break the non-proliferation regime to bring india in uh no bigger symbol that we could have made in terms of an emerging security partnership strategic partnership than initiating uh the opportunity to, to begin uh, nuclear trade and bring india into the uh, non-proliferation regime uh it wasn't just about nuclear uh we wanted to tie up a stronger security relationship we wanted to win defense deals There's a whole bunch of things I think that we all sort of uh, had in mind when we first began to talk about this partnership and building it during the Bush administration. Uh made good progress, uh got our first defense deals across the finish line, deepened our types of exercises that we did. Um the President Obama came to office. And a couple of things happened early on that uh forced the United States to lose a bit of interest in India as a strategic partner. Uh first and foremost, you know, the the big um, uh fighter aircraft deal that the united states was hoping that this partnership would give us an inside in for the multi, uh, media multi role combat aircraft the two platforms that we put forward for this uh, weren't carried forward to the finals so uh, that was painful we thought that uh, we had a pretty good chance just because of uh, opening up the uh, the nuclear regime and such 
And second, on nuclear cooperation itself, um, you know, the bill that would allow for nuclear cooperation by setting a, a strong liability regime uh, in case there is a nuclear accident, uh, they weren't able to, the, the government wasn't able to get a clean bill through parliament. It got watered down and essentially precluded U.S. Indian nuclear cooperation. It, it allowed for unlimited liability for nuclear suppliers and foreign firms wouldn't supply knowing that uh, if, if an accident didn't happen, did happen, that they could be on the hook for unlimited liability. So uh, I think, you know, during the Obama administration, right around the time that you saw the articulation of the pivot or the rebalance was right about the time that India was kind of falling out of favor. You know, the two biggest things that we'd bet uh, a lot of uh, time, money, and energy on had fallen off the table, and uh, interest in India as a partner was lost at the same time that we articulated this broader Asia strategy. So uh, on uh, October 18, 2017, uh, we were very privileged at CSIS to host the former Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, his first speech on foreign policy, and he chose to come by and make that speech about India and the Indo-Pacific. And he shared with me and uh, uh, with a couple of others um, the speech about a day before he delivered it and uh, really raised our eyebrows. None of us had really thought that the Trump administration had went that far yet in trying to articulate what an Asia strategy would be and what it would look like. I'll give you an example of some of the language that Tillerson used in that speech. He talked about the United States and India as the port and starboard lights for Asian security. Now, as, as a 20-year India wonk, it's very exciting to see India articulated in those terms. To our friends in Japan and Australia and Korea, countries where we have, you know, basing and combined military and things, um, to perceive of India already as, uh, as, as a partner above all others on Asian security uh, was a thought that was perhaps even a bit ahead of its time, but a great visionary statement that we all wanted to accede to. Now, that announcement happened without a lot of details on what the free and open Indo-Pacific would look like. Some challenges were called out uh, by Secretary Tillerson in a speech, and about the same time, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Mattis, in testimony on Capitol Hill, articulated a lot of the same principles. But there wasn't a lot of detail, and so the U.S. government since that time has been uh, actively working on trying to articulate what does it mean. Everybody wants to see the details, similar to the, the rebalance of the pivot. When we characterize the rebalance of the pivot as a long-term shift in resources away from places that were, you know, less relevant uh, and more to, uh, to Asia, where you saw all the big opportunities and the big threats, um, nobody wants to talk about 50-year uh, transitions of funding and, and material and equipment. They want to see new bases, new positioning, new posturing. And the rebalance, the pivot, there weren't that many detailed points that people could respond to. And then you began to see China play a much more aggressive role in Asia, building islands, militarizing those islands, things like this. So uh, waiting for the United States to have a more robust, more robust response. So now with the free and open Indo-Pacific articulating, you know, Trump's vision about what, uh, President Trump's vision about uh, our, our, our strong interest in Asia, you know, what's the detail? What, what changes are we going to make to U.S. strategic policy that would help to underscore that? Similarly, um, you know, there, there was a, um, a bit of work that began in trying to think more deeply about how the United States becomes a more active player on in infrastructure. Again, another topic that Secretary Tillerson articulated in a speech, something which India remained for eight months or so, the only country with the courage to call out the One Belt, One Road as debt trap diplomacy, things like this. A lot of Americans wrote it off and said it was, it was India, it was spilled milk, they didn't like the fact that China was investing so heavily in Pakistan. But we all know that there's plenty of other examples about how China had actually built up really strong relations, not always uh, conforming to India's interest with a lot of India's neighbors. Plenty of examples about how China had used money to buy influence in India's own neighborhood. It wasn't just the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So uh, not long after... Um, uh, after Tillerson's speech, you saw the uh, release of the National Security Strategy by the White House, the National Defense Strategy. Uh, both of these took place a little over a year ago. Again, articulating what the concerns are and what the opportunities are that we saw across the, uh, the Asia Pacific. Now today, a year after all this took place and the release of the strategies, what changes have you seen in U.S. posturing towards Asia? I'd say by and large, it's a series of, of loosely, if connected at all, steps but you have seen changes. Iran, shredding the JCPOA agreement, believing that there might be a better deal around the corner. So Iran, you've seen a big change in, in, in U.S. position and strategy. Um, you take a look at North Korea, 
uh, threatening, um, uh, threatening the dictator of North Korea initially, then engaging and hoping that uh, that one-two punch, threaten a dictator, then engage, will yield some outcomes there. May, may not, but certainly the level of dialogue is considerably higher than it was before the Trump administration took office. Pakistan, a dramatic drawdown in, in financial support for Pakistan, something which uh, India has been requesting for, uh, for a generation, um, but you've seen a real sharp turn in that in recent years. On trade, um, one of the ways that the Obama administration would articulate the free, uh, their version of the Indo-Pacific, the, um, uh, the rebalance, the pivot, was the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this monster trade agreement, including Japan, a number of ASEAN nations, um, as, as really indicative of our commitment to the region, trying to lash our economies together. Uh, trade, though, has suddenly become you know, a very different approach by the Trump administration. It's been viewed as a drain on the U.S. economy rather than as a proactive tool to mesh economies together. So we withdrew from Trans-Pacific Partnership, which had been one of the primary economic um, uh, engagements we had under the, uh, the pivot, the rebalance, um, and instead, uh, you know, treating trade more as a, uh, as a concern rather than a magnet for economies. Climate change. Uh, climate change wasn't all about the, uh, the pivot, the rebalance. It's not all about the free and open Indo-Pacific. But when you think about climate change and who it is that's going to impact that, uh, China, both as an emitter but also as a producer of most of the equipment that would go into combating climate change, India, which is yet to go through a major industrial phase, which most countries hopefully do go through on the way to production. So climate change, the fact that you've seen a sharp break in the U.S. approach to climate change has impacted our strategy towards Asia. So uh, I, I don't know that it's necessarily terribly connected in a comprehensive strategy, but if you talk about changes that we've made in Asia, there's a number that you can point to since the Trump administration took office that have changed at least how we deal with individual countries and a couple of overarching initiatives like trade and climate change. Huge impact in terms of how we engage Asia. The last one is China. Um, China, that's always been what we considered when we talked about the pivot, the rebalance, as the main strategic threat that we saw in the region. A country that wanted to upend the order that we believe has delivered prosperity to many countries across the region there. Um, and what were their intentions? What were long-term intentions? Was it aligned with setting a world order that we could all live with? Was it upending in a China-driven order that would not account for others' opinions? Um, I think we all in this room probably have our own opinions upon what those intentions are. I don't need to go into it. But certainly the United States' approach to China has seen a sh very sharp break. We believed, you know, going back to the 1970s when we began to engage China, hoping to split them apart from the Soviet Union, that uh, ultimately engaging China and bringing them into the global fold would make China more like us, more like America. I mean, that's an American viewpoint, and I'll, I'll happily admit that's what a lot of Americans thought there. They'll become uh, pro-traders. They'll believe in the system. They'll become democratic. There'll be elections pretty soon. You know, this is the kind of things that um, Americans certainly wanted to believe. Uh, you know, looking over time, uh, some elements of that come true. Many elements have not. They're in the system. They've enjoyed market access to other countries. They haven't necessarily reciprocated in all cases. They become increasing militaristic. Elections, even within the party, <laughs> are now a distant memory as the, we have a president for life. And, and two, the private sector in, in, in China, um, the opportunities are a lot less than they were. You know, first of all, you've got rising wage, lab, rising wage rates, uh, it's less of an attractive uh, destination for manufacturing investment. In the United States, the private sector has a huge influence on foreign policy. President Trump isn't the first U.S. president that's come into office saying, I'm going to be more aggressive on China. But typically that gets dialed down because the U.S. private sector, which has an enormous lobbying experience, they, they have deep roots, they have major manufacturing in China. A lot of what we import from China in the United States is actually American-made products. They set up factories in China. So the idea about you know, tilting and wobbling the relationship, uh, trade aggression, uh, it actually hurts American companies directly. But with uh, reduced interest in the market, you see FDI levels into China dropping even before this, uh, theft of intellectual property, things like that. Um, this time you don't see the counter push in the United States by the private sector pressing so hard for stability. There still are voices that want us to ratchet down trade tensions, but it's, uh, it's died down considerably from what it was. Um, so, so China, you've seen the sharpest uh, break from what previous policy was. And really, you know, engaging in economic warfare, trade war, is, is kind of the, the front end of that. 
You still see things that were begun before that, like the freedom of navigation operations against these fake islands that China's building in the South China Sea and other places. But, um, but really, the, the main thrust of it so far in engaging China directly is on trade. The, uh, I mentioned briefly that um, you know, Secretary Tillerson, in a speech at CSIS, talked about debt trap diplomacy as one of the things that uh, the United States was concerned about. Uh, Japan's been very active in this space. Um, India raising alarm bells about concerns on this, especially the pools of funding that are really untied to transparency and the kind of things that the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and others support. Uh, the United States has been a little bit slow in figuring out how we can become a player in the infrastructure game, mainly because the United States doesn't have a major development bank, unlike a lot of uh, other large countries. But um, you have seen in recent months a couple of steps to, to fill in that gap. Um, so our current Secretary of State, uh, Pompeo, uh, he had announced um, in uh, late July of this year uh, a small pool of funding, a little over $100 million, that the U.S. Department of State was setting aside to try to spend money in areas that would unlock the U.S. private sector. So the $100 million wasn't meant to compete with the tens and tens of billions that others are spending. But instead, it was meant to be, you know, $113 million, I think was the number, targeted programs that would unlock the U.S. private sector. The U.S. private sector, deep pools of capital, rich experience doing business across Asia, but not really big infrastructure players. Because the infrastructure game in Asia, frankly, it's a dangerous game. Contract sanctity, repayment, things like that, uh, it, it's not the most secure environment to plop down big, big projects and such. So, um, so the U.S. government thinking through how can they turn $113 million into something much larger. And then Congress passed legislation, the BUILD Act, which has set out another $30 billion for our Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is the closest equivalent we have to a development bank. So now OPEC is suddenly, uh, this new $30 billion, they have a total corpus of $60 billion. So suddenly, you know, there is a little bit of money in the kitty and some thoughts and initiatives to try to figure out how we unlock the private sector to begin playing in the Indo-Pacific infrastructure game. So, uh, again, even on the infrastructure side right now, there's a lot of deep thinking going on in terms of how do we capitalize this money? How, how do you spend $113 million in unlock the private sector when, you know, we're talking about competing with what China's investing in? Is China looking for a commercial rate of return on its investments in the region? Ask Sri Lanka. Ask Maldives. Generally, no. They want access. They want to vote, vote against Taiwan the next time a tough vote comes up in the United Nations. These are things that the U.S. private sector does not usually consider part of its balance sheet. <laughs> a vote against Taiwan in the U.N. is not usually part of what a private sector firm looks at in terms of return on investment. So, uh, so right now, I think the United States, um, we've articulated the threats that we see. Um, we have taken, at least on the trade front, uh, a, a, new, a new type of fight with China pretty directly. We've got money set aside for infrastructure, but there aren't yet a lot of answers. You know, what are the specific force placements we want to change under the free and open Indo-Pacific? How are we going to spend this infrastructure money? Um, so for scholars around the room, uh, we're always hungry for ideas. So uh, take that one as, uh, as a call for uh, arms, a call for papers in terms of, um, you know, what, what happens in this space. Let me talk briefly, and I'll conclude on this, is talking a bit about the, um, uh, the current state of, uh, of U.S.-India relations in this. So the Indo-Pacific, Indo, this was done very intentionally. You know, a call to India that, again, we've integrated our Asia strategy. Again, we didn't coin the term, of course, but when we began to use it, um, it was a call to India to say that, you know, India is now part of our overall Asia strategy. Now, I think U.S. policymakers, when they first conceived of this, they had a very different intention in mind. Can we get India to be a more active player in what the United States saw as the leading edge of the contest, meaning East Asia? South China Sea, East China Sea, you know, China attempting to upend the, the current security regime in the region there. Can we get India to be more active player um, in those waters where we see kind of the point end of the spear right now in reshaping, you know, the Indo-Pacific security alignment? Uh, India's view, I think, which has been articulated very effectively, is um, that's already the old game. The new game is China's encroachment in the Indian Ocean region itself. So Indo-Pacific is not dragging India through the Malacca Straits. It's can the United States articulate a strategy to help India's interest in the Indian Ocean. It has to be both sides. We talk about Indian Ocean Pacific, and right now, you know, for, for a long time we were talking past each other. 
I think for the first time you begin to see America waking up to what India has been raising on this. You saw it, for instance, our new uh, cabinet-level annual dialogue, the 2 plus 2, where the U.S. Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense came to India. And we began talking about some brand new things, particularly India would have more access to our central command, which is the, um, uh, the military agency that actually monitors everything west of India, uh, all the way to the African coast, where we have a separate command, the AFRICOM. Um, you saw it every year uh, the, the U.S. Department of Defense submits a, a report to Congress on China's military modernization. And this most recent report that came out last year, there were more references than ever before in terms of China's increased ability to access the Indian Ocean, the military's ability to access the Indian Ocean. So I think slowly the United States is waking up to the concern that India's raised, which is, you know, trying to pull India into the fight that we looked at as the, uh, the most important on the, on the page was ignoring the fact that already new spaces are opening up and being contested. And can the United States uh, offer some kind of assistance and partnership with India to confront those challenges? So uh, there's a lot on the table right now. But uh, overall, um, I think the United States shifting away from thinking about India as a global partner. Um, you know, your relations with Russia, which we have deep problems with, Iran, things like this, we reset away from that. We don't think of it as a global partnership as much. So it's, it's not as wide, I would say, as probably we're thinking about the India relationship as a few years ago, but it's deepening. And I think our two sides are able to have a lot more open, honest conversations about our shared concerns. For India, it's the Indian Ocean. For the United States, what, what's happening in East Asia. And so uh, I do think that, um, you know, you've seen it through successive administrations. Um, you see a lot on the table right now. Agreements are being signed to get our two militaries to work more effectively together every single time the two countries get together practically. So uh, good areas of cooperation and, uh, and I think a lot more honest conversation. So I'll wrap it up at that and happy to take questions on whatever's on folks' mind if there's time for questions still. We have five minutes. Five we, minutes can actually, yeah. we can have questions. On this, to Rick, to me, to anybody else, to Professor Soya. Anybody for questions? Yes, please. Is yeah, um, so the question was about, um, you know, China's infrastructure investments, particularly uh, uh, ports, maritime investments in the Indian Ocean. Is there a U.S. strategy for that? Um, you know, with, uh, with Hanban Toda, obviously, you know, at the time, China was dealing with a government that the United States had uh, less access to. Uh, certainly, the United States was, uh, was trying to freeze out the, uh, the, the government in Sri Lanka at the time. Um, that's a ripe opportunity for China to engage, you know, countries that are kind of left out in the cold there. Um, so I have a couple, of, a couple of responses to that. Number one, for countries that are open to consultations, you know, can we deploy um, expertise to get in there and offer them guidance in terms of whether these kind of investments will ever be commercially viable? Now, again, sometimes the host government will say yes to it, even if it's never going to be commercially viable. A, they want investment, they want the job creation, B, sometimes they want to line their pockets deeply. And so that's something that no matter what we do, you can't convince a government not to. But in some cases, if you point out that the commercial relevance will never be there, maybe they will say no. So that's one element to it. Um, the second element, and this is a tough one for the United States to grapple with, is uh, for those countries where the United States, for other reasons, has cut off or slow-walked uh, uh, engagement. Take Myanmar. You know, what's happened in Rakhine State is terrible. But yet Myanmar is one of those pivot point nations right now in the fight for interests across Asia. So uh, we are not engaging Myanmar deeply right now, not talking about necessarily prospective, proactive, big programs we can do together. But at the same time, you know, during the Cold War, we had to engage a lot of countries that, you know, on one hand we had discomfort with, and on the other hand we didn't want them to fall into the Soviet orbit. So, you know, it's something we're grappling with. I don't know how we're going to come out on that second point. Do we engage those countries that, you know, when it was a unipolar world, when the United States was the only major force, we could say, you're good, you're bad, cut you off, we'll wait you out. Um, now that it's becoming, again, bipolar or multipolar, uh, whether we still have that luxury to sit and wait for countries to kind of turn on their own accord, I don't know. So counseling is good. Um, some of the economic programs we can do to offer alternatives for financing for those kind of projects is good. 
Um, how we treat countries that may be unaligned with our views on global issues, that's a tricky one. So that's uh, probably the best I can do right now. And, yeah. Um, Pakistan, big issue here in India, perhaps the biggest issue. Uh, for a few decades now, it's been one of America's major frenemies, allies, whatever, in regards to Afghanistan. The complication with the U.S. stating it wants to pull out of Afghanistan as India is starting to um, deepen its engagement there. So, AFPAC. Yeah. Well, I, I am, I mean, to be, to be quite honest, I mean, I'm more of an India hand than even a South Asia hand. But, you know, with Pakistan, you do see a more clear-eyed approach to the fact that, um, you know, they are clearly targeting in Afghanistan American interests directly. Um, you, can, you can say it, but the proof points that we've developed are a lot stronger now. So, um, but yet they've, uh, even despite the drawdown in funding, they've managed to maintain, you know, our, our ability to, uh, to move material and equipment through. So, um, you know, I'd say the United States in some ways kind of has it both ways. We've got access through Pakistan to Afghanistan. Uh, at the same time, we're drawing down funding, but we certainly know that they are there to destabilize the country that we would like to see survive this entire transition point now. Um, you know, the threat that uh, we'd all had perceived is that if the United States drew down financially from Pakistan, China would step in. Well, it's there. It's happening. We know it. We recognize it. Um, the question is, could that actually be another boon? Um, China, you know, what would they like to see in Afghanistan ultimately? Instability or stability? You know, they'd like to see stability as well. So I think in terms of Afghanistan and China filling in the void, um, there's a reasonable chance, although we're all taking, reason, you know, chances on this kind of thing, that um, China's influence, at least in terms of how Pakistan engages Afghanistan, may be loosely aligned um, with what U.S. interest is there. Um, but, uh, you know, still the country in the middle that we're talking about, Pakistan, its interests are not. And so the pressure is going to continue to maintain there. And as the United States draws down support, our ability to kind of influence things, not that we ever necessarily had a lot of it, um, is declined quite a bit. So I'd say, like, you know, speaking in India, um, we've given what India was requesting. I think that has helped us actually deepen the security partnership with India, um, the fact that we're kind of responding to that. Um, but we don't know where the cards go from here. So uh, it's, a, it's a big black hole, I think. But it seems that we're jumping into it either way, huh? <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Mishra, and then we are winding up for tea. I want there also. Uh, sure, I will just... Very, uh, we'll take together. Uh, just one or two questions. Uh, this is about same Afghanistan, particularly. You think uh, India has a lot of installations in Afghanistan. We have our own interest also. I know you will be withdrawing very soon from Afghanistan. Do you think in Indian perspective, alone with uh, your a discussion with Taliban and Islamic culture coming there and taking over the country and with Pakistan's interference, we will be the India will be capable enough to give security to its own installation in Afghanistan. Number two. No, we don't have installation in Afghanistan. I live We there. have I few. We have few. I know it I have visited. We no, have no, few. No, no. Yes. And uh, Second is, uh, as far as CPEC is concerned, particularly the Gaza issue and deployment of Chinese army, particularly the PLA, in our own territory, Pak-occupied Kashmir, what about your views in that, in the CPEC? These are two questions. We have installations there. I think that's an easy one. No, um, we, I don't think we have the kind of leverage we could put on, on China um, to get them. And um, a non-government perspective, yeah. um, which nobody's going to like, uh, I don't think we're going to put a lot of energy behind India's candidacy. Um, China, like, we're in a room talking about Indo-Pacific. Russia is perhaps a greater threat today. And every time that you see India deep in its relationship with Russia, there is a huge camp in the United States. This is not like spilled milk, remembrance of Cold War. They've invaded two countries. They have attempted to derail multiple democratic elections, not just the United States, but many others. So when you see that kind of thing, what I mentioned before, like, the good news is the United States is looking at this as an Asia partnership, not a global partnership. 
Because if we were looking at global, and we would see, you know, some of the, and, and India would see, feel the same about some U.S. relations. So I think the momentum behind the United States putting India on the global table, like Security Council, I think that's lost a bit of momentum. But again, we're deepening and doing a lot better stuff locally. So it's a mix. I'm not trying to say all bad. Um, Afghanistan, India, you know, can India provide security for itself? Well, that is the most dangerous job anybody in the world could ever have. An Indian soldier in Afghanistan where Pakistan proxies are wreaking havoc. So I hope it never comes down to the point where you feel you need to have your own people out there offering um, security to facilities that you built out there. Um, you know, India has, you know, avoided that, done training here and that kind of thing. I hope it never gets to the level where you feel you need to deploy, because I can just imagine the kind of threats they'd be under every single day. CPEC, um, you know, obviously the uh, the commercial relevance of CPEC itself is pretty nominal. Um, you know, the United States government hasn't tried to uh, make forward-leaning statements necessarily on the specific that you bring on, on Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. So there is no, that I've heard, official position on that per se. But throwing Pakistan a lifeline at the time that um, – the United States is withdrawing funding and hope it's going to change the ways. I think overall we would like to see Pakistan or we'd like to see China divert its approach to, to, to Pakistan altogether. So I don't think we've made comment on the specific pointed issue, but overall in the corridor itself, um, a lot of discomfort. We don't see the commercial relevance to that, and therefore they will control, you know, a basic water most likely. What they use it for is yet to be determined. But, you know, the islands in the South China Sea began as vacation spots, and now they have missiles. I think it's been a very, very interesting. I'll just end before we break for tea with this this line that this economist guy writes, Ritri Sharma, India has a terrific tendency to disappoint both the optimist and the pessimist. <laughs> so, you know, we have something which you don't have and it works to disparage the both of us. We retain institutional memory for a very long time and we change them once in eight years or whatever, you know. So it... This does lead to a completely different, but we have to absolutely get over it. We are still very hesitant players in that sense, very, very hesitant, and therefore obviously disappointing. And I don't think we should say Shimara's like Security Council at this. It really serves absolutely no purpose. Let's have a quick break, 15-minute break for tea. We are only five minutes over shot, which is not a bad thing at all. <laughs> we'll gather for the first session on examining the Indo-Pacific in 15 minutes' time. Tea is 